Thanks so much for joining me, Helen Browning, in a conversation with Lord, Lord Goldsmith as part of Trade Unwrapped, a food farming and countryside commission project designed to explore what matters to us in the UK as we build new trading relationships with the world. Uh, welcome, Lord Goldsmith. Thank you very much for joining us. this. Thank you, Helen. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so many people, I'm one of them, uh, feel quite daunted, I think, by this whole debate, um, if you're not an expert. Uh, and the discussion can get either very technical uh, or very polarised, rather simplistic. And we're trying to make this um, much more accessible to many more people uh, and, uh, and to try and involve many more people in a sort of deeper discussion about the issues. So I'm going to suggest if we get into any technicalities um, that we try and explain them as we go along, probably for my benefit as much as anybody else's. <laughs> well, I, I won't be doing that, I hope. That's really good to hear. Um, so I'd like to start by asking you, what's important to you uh, in terms of how we approach trade and what that says about uh, what we stand for in the world at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge question, actually. Because, and, and I don't think you can separate trade from other economic considerations. I think one of the, the probably the biggest challenge we face today as a species is reconciling the market or reconciling the economy, the way we do the economy with nature. Uh, at the moment, the, the market, I think we can agree, is probably the most powerful force for change other than nature itself. But, but unless the market learns how to value valuable things, things that fundamentally actually we can't live without, but which don't have a value yet, and learns to attach a cost somehow to things that we don't like, pollution, waste, use of scarce resources and so on, then the market, that power in the market is gonna be driving us further and further towards what, what I think is disaster territory. I think, and it's not just a matter of opinion, look at the, the, the sort of avalanche of, of reports we've seen in the last few weeks alone tell us that we're heading very fast in the wrong direction. So I think trade should be seen in, in that context. Um, and when we talk about trade, I don't think it's right that environmental sustainability or animal welfare should be just bits of a trade agreement, a kind of add-on thing that, that is attached to the way we normally do free trade agreements. I think they have to be a lens through which we make decisions generally. Um, and that is true not just of trade agreements, it's true of all decisions we make. And I don't think any government in the world has fully taken that on board. I think there are a few examples like Costa Rica who've made a big go of it, uh, but no one's really nailed this. And, and, and I do think that the UK government is is seriously grappling with these issues and doing so in good faith you know we we put the environment sustainability as one of our top three priorities in terms of our uk ambition in the context of world trade organization and we did so very sort of clearly earlier this year um I, i'm not sure i can describe that as a world first but it may be and we're completely determined that in the pursuit of free trade agreements new agreements with other countries um, that, that we, we use them not only to project our, our values around the world, but to, um, to take us further towards achieving the goals that we've set as well. So expansion of the, uh, the, the market that is going to lead to a, a transition to a cleaner economy, for example, a, a sustainable goods and services. And in addition to that, we've committed, but, but there's still a lot of work to be done, clearly, on all these things. We've committed that we will not compromise on the things that matter to people here, our high animal welfare standards, our environmental standards, in the pursuit of free trade agreements. And just one key distinction, that's not just about maintaining standards in the UK. It's about ensuring that the stuff that we import isn't going to be undercutting those standards, because you could have the highest animal welfare standards in the world, as in many respects, I think we do. And I think you'd agree as a producer of fine produce um, uh, um, with a high animal welfare standard, we, we can raise standards as much as we like. But if we don't apply that same sort of approach to the food that we're bringing in from other countries, all we're doing is undermining our producers and exporting cruelty to other countries. So it's, I, and that, that distinction, I think, is really central, really key. Um, and this is an issue that we're grappling with. So our, our commitment is there and it is unwavering. And I know there's been a massive amount of discussion about that and, and, and lots of accusations flying around, but the commitment is there. It's unchanged from when we put the manifesto together to today. And we're figuring out exactly what that means in terms of free trade, because this has not been done before. 
That's a very long answer to some apologies, but it's a great, it's a great answer, and it, I think a lot of people would find it massively reassuring. And yet, people aren't don't feel that reassured at the moment. No. For some reason, people still feel really nervous about this. Um, and I think you know, I, I don't know how you read the move music around it, but it seems to be something really people really care about. So why do yeah. why why do people not feel reassured by this at the moment? Do you think? I think there are lots of reasons for that. I think that uh, most fundamentally, I think the reason is that people don't trust politicians. And I think that that's true all over the world. There's this kind of terrible breakdown in trust between kind of people and power um, and polarization of debate in a really unhealthy manner. So, I'm, and, I, and I'm not suggest I'm not attributing blame uh, for that. It's just a fact that people tend not to believe what they're told by, by governments. Um, a, 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 a second part to it is that we haven't fully explained how we intend to deliver that commitment. How are we going to honor our promise? We said we're going to honor the promise. We haven't said how we're going to honor the promise. And, and I'm, I'm going to disappoint you no doubt but because I can't build on that particularly not that work hasn't been done it is you know DEFRA and the Department of International Trade are beavering away trying to figure out the best possible approach and we're pretty much there but I, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to kind of go into the details of that but until we tell that story until we explain what we're going to do then that that cynicism that skepticism is going to continue to bubble away and there's a third reason which is true of politics everywhere is that, you know, there's a there's an opportunity in this for opposition parties. They recognize that people do care and people really do care. You don't have to be an environmentalist or even an animal welfare campaigner to care about the standards in this country. Uh, and even if you don't care about either of those things, you care about fairness and it's not fair to our producers to ask them to do one thing and then to allow stuff to come in from other countries that, that is much easier to produce and doesn't have to go through those same loops. So people, you know, this is one of those issues that unites a really very, very broad base of of, of supporters um, and that's an opportunity for politics so to, to kind of ham up people's fears about what might happen is quite an easy thing to do um, I would prefer it I have to say as speaking as a government minister I would prefer it if the government was uh, get going with explaining exactly what we're doing and not wait too long I think we have a great story to tell there and I, it frustrates me sometimes that we're, we haven't told that story yet but I'm sure there are good reasons for that because I think that people feel, uh, you know, if we had it in law, if, if we could legislate for this, yeah. then we'd be safe. But there must be reasons why that feels a difficult route to go down. Yeah, I think that I th the government doesn't want to, um, I mean, there are lots of things that you might want to put in law around a free trade agreement. There are probably 30 or 40 things that that you'd want to see as absolutes, as red lines in a free trade agreement. We don't have those red lines. That's just not the way the government, this or any previous government, has ever wanted to conduct these kinds of negotiations. It wants the freedom to be able to have discussions with, um, uh, without kind of being, being steered by uh, 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 opposition legislation. Um, and and I, I get that. I mean, if I was doing the negotiating, I'd, I'd probably want the freedom to be able to, to just approach this issue in a, in a completely open and transparent manner without preconditions having been set by Parliament. So I, I do understand that. Um, I mean, you could make the same argument for, um, for any number of issues relating to climate change, relating to the broader environment. Um, you could make the same argument in relation to our global environmental footprint. Uh, you know, we could sort our own backyard out almost completely. We could hit net zero long before 2050. I hope we do. But if we are importing produce that comes with heavy carbon uh, um, um, footprints themselves or carbon price tags, then we're not actually solving the problem. So there are lots of different things that could be included in law as kind of prerequisites before or red lines within the pursuit of free trade agreements. But that is not the way the government wants to do it. And I have some sympathy for that. But that but the commitment is there. Uh, and I would simply say this, if, if the government is seen not to have honored that commitment. The government knows very well that there would be a big price to pay for that. You know, as I said at the beginning, faith or, or trust between people and politicians is at probably an all-time low um, uh, uh, for, for many reasons. Globally, I think that's probably the case. And it is therefore not good politics to break what are pretty straightforward and clear promises um, that were made before the manifesto, before the general election. So, I mean, it's, you know, I don't see that the legislation makes a huge amount of difference, to be honest. But actually having that public opinion so strong, it actually helps give government... Yeah. That yeah, that, by the way, that's true of everything. I mean, I, one of the frustrations I have as a, you know, I'm an environmental activist. I have been all my life. I'm also a minister. And, and, and um, as you know, and um, 
it, it, what frustrates me sometimes is when the government does really good things in relation to the environment. And I, I genuinely believe that, that we are world leaders on so many areas in relation to the environment. Masses, masses more to do, but, but we are doing some really good stuff. Um, and one of the frustrations, I think, is when, when you know, genuine, authentic, proper environmentalists and environmental groups, don't, they don't like acknowledging that because there's this kind of dislike of government, dislike of politics. And I do feel that, you know, there are plenty of politicians who are purely opportunistic and, and therefore a bit of praise when they get things right makes that stick much more frightening when they bash you for getting things wrong. But if everything's a continuous howl of complaint, um, I, politically, I think that's unhelpful. So as a minister, I like the pressure because it strengthens my hand on the things that I care about and I'm pushing. Uh, but it would be useful when the government gets it right. If Bayes does something really good on energy or the Foreign Office does something really good in terms of our global environmental footprint or our climate COP agenda, acknowledgement is helpful because it kind of rewards those politicians who probably, you know, in some cases do need that in order to do the right thing. Yeah, it's a hard it's a hard position to be in, isn't it? Never getting any praise for anything. It's always yes, but uh, we want more. Yeah about those those values that I think have been demonstrated so strongly by the public over the last little while even if it's in sometimes a slightly simplistic terms do you think there might have to be trade-offs between those values what you know what are your sort of own red lines or where would you prioritize if we have to prioritize uh, the the many things we want to get out of our trading relationships when it comes to free trade agreements specifically, there, there are, the whole thing is about trade-offs. I mean, inherently, when you're opening your market to competition, that comes with risk and it requires compromise. Um, it's always very high profile. It's, it's always a sensitive issue. Um, but I think it, it, you know, clearly it can be done in such a way that, that, that you're never going to have an entirely win-win scenario. Um, but there are all kinds of areas where you know, you can strike the right balance between getting a better price at the till for consumers and the kind of associated costs to the domestic economy. There are areas where, and I think renewable energies are probably a good example. The cost of solar has come down 90% since the banking crisis, 90%. That's going to make transition to a clean economy so much easier. That's because of international trade. Um, and it feels to me that the more you can use trade agreements to um, facilitate that kind of exchange, the more I think we all benefit, but there are always going to be areas that that where where you open things up too much, um, you apply a different set of standards, and you start damaging stuff that really does need protection. Um, but I, I think it is possible to strike the right balance. But I have to say that we're you know this is slightly uncharted territory. The World Trade Organization. Um, is not fit for purpose, in my view. It is an old organization running on old interpretations of what's important um, through the World Trade Organization. There are, I mean, I can't tell you how, I don't think there's been a single week since I've been a minister where I haven't wanted to do something where someone hasn't said, hang on a second, we'll be challenged under the World Trade Organization. Animal welfare, environmental standards, so many ethical issues in terms of other things that we import that many people would like us not to import. And my view is actually, we need to start being a really robust bust and let's 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 take the risk let's allow ourselves to be challenged by the wto or through the wto um, and, and perhaps use those moments to try and push for an upgrade in the way the wto operates um, but we are in slightly unch uncharted territory um, and i think that's what makes it exciting we could do something through our free trade agreements here and i think we will do stuff through our uh, pursuit of free trade agreements that will hopefully create a kind of benchmark for how these things can be conducted in the future between other countries I mean, it's an extraordinary opportunity in many ways. And when you yeah. talk about reforming the WTO and uh, the role we might play in that, do you think we've, we, we've still got the weight to actually uh, you know, be able to have influence in that way? Oh, completely. I think one of the greatest misconceptions in relation to Brexit um, is the idea that we're not going to have a seat at the table. I think, on the contrary, by being an independent country, and don't forget, we're you know, taking turns being the fifth and sixth biggest economy in the world. We're you know, the biggest contributor to most of the MDBs. We, you know, we are major participants in the, the global system. Um, and none of that changes because of Brexit. I mean, in many cases, we have an actual seat at the table as opposed to a small part of a much you know, more pooled seat in the table. Um, and as a consequence, we're able to help shape the, shape the rules. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, just a few weeks ago, 
folks, uh, the UN General Assembly, 76 countries, I think it was 76, signed up to the Leaders Pledge for Nature. And if you or any of uh, the listeners today were to read that Leaders, Leaders Pledge for Nature, you would agree, I think, that it is the most radical, the most ambitious, the boldest such declaration that's ever been signed uh, on an international level, um, ever. Um, and the reason for that is the UK. It was initially negotiated between Costa Rica and the EU, and the UK became involved, very much picked up the reins, uh, argued over every word, every sentence, because we felt that it was a very bland document that wasn't really moving the dial, and we transformed it. And as a consequence, as a very, very powerful declaration. Obviously, turning those words into action is the real challenge, but we have the basis on which to do so. And that was the UK on its own, working internationally, exerting influence. And there are many, many other examples of that. Another example very recently is the, uh, the UK has been single-handedly pressing the big multilateral development banks to improve access to finance for the really vulnerable nations, the climate vulnerable nations, many of which are small island developing states. And we've persuaded, for example, the GCF uh, to the major contributor in terms of climate finance to ensure that half their money goes to those climate vulnerable nations. That, that's a big jump in the right direction. And that, that again was negotiated by us. And there are many, many other examples as well. So yes, the UK has a big voice and particularly on this area of environment and climate change where I think objectively we are seen as world leaders. Um, again, I don't wanna be complacent. There's masses, masses, masses more we need to do, but we are world leaders. And I think when it comes to talking about these issues, people listen. I mean, there are countries right now privately telling us they are waiting for us to announce our position on various things with the view to aligning their policies with us on really significant issues. Um, and that's something which I have to say is quite new to me as a minister. I hadn't been fully aware of how, how important what we say and what we do is on the world stage. Stage, but it is. You talked a bit about poorer nations and sometimes that's been used as a, as a, as a sort of debating point here. How do we make sure that we get it right so that we're not offshoring either our responsibilities or our overconsumption on the rest of the world and get it right for those poorer nations too? It's a really, it's an important, a really important point, but it, ultimately no one benefits, rich, poor, north, south, east, west, if we trash the environment. Uh, in fact, uh, although you and I and everyone listening depends fundamentally on the natural world completely for absolutely everything, the poorer the community, the more direct that dependence is. So there are about a billion people who depend directly for forests on, for their livelihoods. So a billion people depend on fish as their main source of protein. About 200 million people depend on fishing for their livelihood. So, you know, th that dependence is absolutely, there's no middleman, it's absolutely direct. Um, whereas we sometimes, I think, can feel quite insulated from the raw natural environment. That's not true for the the poorest communities, when you trash the environment, when you destroy ecosystems, when you destroy fish stocks, or we continue destroying forests at the rate of 30 football pitches per minute, the, the, the people who pay the price first are the poorest communities in the world, and they can pay a really terrible price. So it's in their, it's in all of our interests, clearly, but it's in their interests most directly that we stop this appalling destruction that we're seeing at the moment. And there are things we can do. So one of the things the UK is doing, and it is, I think, a world, it is genuinely a world first, is we are, uh, we have consulted on measures that we, that I hope we'll be able to take to require big businesses in the UK to ensure that as they import agricultural commodities, that they're not also importing deforestation by mistake. So about 80% of deforestation in the world is caused by growing internationally traded commodities. And deforestation as itself is about the, it's the second biggest contributor to, or second biggest source of emissions. So getting deforestation out of the supply chains is massively important, but at the same time, we recognize that the international trade in those commodities is massively important for producers around the world. It's the basis of many, many millions of livelihoods. So we've got to get the right policy the right approach we've got to do so in cooperation with countries around the world and that's what the UK is trying to do as part of our presidency of COP but also linked very strongly to the CBD agenda which is the, the Convention on Biological Diversity which is being hosted in China um, sometime next year so this is we are we are attempting to build a big alliance and if we get other countries to do what I hope we'll do in relation to cleaning up our supply chains you could theoretically flip the market so that forests become worth more alive than dead and the second big strand of work we're doing in that sort 
of area as part of our presidency of COP is, is trying to tackle land use subsidies. So, you know, in the UK, we're, we're in the process, as you know, of shifting from the old common agriculture policy to environmental land management, making sure that subsidies we pay to landowners are, are, are conditional upon good environmental management. Um, that's, again, I think a world first, but, but if we can persuade other countries to do something similar, again, we can flip the incentive so that, so that actually it's worth keeping forests alive rather than destroying them. If you consider that the top 50 food producing countries spend $700 billion a year subsidizing often destructive land use, getting a few of those countries to change the way they use their subsidies or deploy those subsidies will have a, a massive impact, much bigger than all of the world's aid agencies combined, in fact, if we get it right. So the, the UK is, is, um, I, I, is in a really important position with the presidency of COP. We have a big megaphone, we've got a big platform and the ability to convene and build coalitions of ambitious countries. And, and that is what we're attempting to do. I can't tell you how far we'll get between now and COP, but the ambition is really high uh, and the stakes obviously are even higher. And I was really encouraged when you were on a call with the uh, with the NFU roundtable the other day that you implied that actually government was in the same place on this now, which I think hasn't always felt the case over the last. Yeah. Few years. It's felt much more fractured. Is that something that you know? Is, is that consensus that the view you're putting forward holding holding fast across government? Yes, it is. And one of the concerns I had, among many concerns relating to COVID. Um, was that it was just such a horror story for so many people and for every economy in the world, including countries that don't even have coronavirus, so they've seen their economies crash on the back of it, the global response to it. Um, and one of the worries I had was that it's it, that the governments can panic when that kind of stuff happens and throw out a lot of sort of long term measures in the pursuit of short term growth, wanting to crank up the engines and get things going and leave the consequences for another generation to pick up. And that hasn't happened. Amazingly, it hasn't happened here and it hasn't happened as far as I can see in many countries around the world where the global discussion, you know, people tease a world, a global uh, uh, international governments for there's no such things in international government people tease countries for using the phrase build back better but actually there is a commitment internationally among countries that we've got an opportunity now to do things differently there's something like 12 trillion dollars that's been identified by governments put aside to uh, ensure a, a, an economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic and how we spend that money is going to have massive implications for generations to come we can spend it in a way that props up the old system and locks in you know emissions and environmental degradation for generations to come or we can do things differently and we can make environmental sustainability the lens through which decisions are made and it feels to me on the whole that it's the latter course that's being chosen by governments and here in the UK I think there is I mean if 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 you know cabinet meetings were public I think people would be really enthused by the discussions that are held around climate change and the environment not just the prime minister uh, who's you know really comes to life and is really passionate when discussing these issues but actually the whole cabinet um, you might have arguments about uh, delivery what what best policies to adopt in order to get to where we need to get to but there doesn't seem to me to be any um, breaking of the consensus that we need to act and that this is a real priority um, and there are some surprising cheerleaders in government people who publicly aren't necessarily associated with the environment and climate but who are really doing good stuff um, to advance the agenda well that's really reassuring to hear i think you know one of the other debates that seems to be swirling around is whether we should be sort of banning things or whether you use tariffs as a way of trying to compensate for the differences. I mean, is it a mix of the two? Is there one or the other that will hold sway, or is that too technical? I'm, question? I'm going. So I'm going to. I'm going to have to give you a semi-political answer that I, I don't want to go into any details and specifics because I just can't do that. But, but broadly speaking, I, I, I think the government has to make use of whatever tool makes sense. And, and there are times when tariffs make sense, and there are times when bans make sense. Um, and so you'll know that one of our, uh, this moves away from the food issue that we began by talking about, but one of our manifesto commitments was to ban the import of hunting trophies from endangered animals. Um, and for things like that, it's hard to imagine tariffs being effective. And you really do have to look at, at the sort of blunter instruments that government has, but in other areas, tariffs uh, would make more sense. It's a slightly political answer and I apologize for that, but that's probably the most I can do. 
And so just finally, because I'm aware we're nearly out of time, you've got to go very shortly. Um, but, uh, you know, your, your overall confidence is that we can crank this up and uh, achieve a sort of race to the top rather than the fears that people have is that we're on a sort of slippery slope to uh, as a race to the bottom. Um, yeah, I, I, am, I, I am never complacent and there will always be need for making and winning the arguments on these issues, broadly speaking, but, and the challenge is so huge. Um, and if you put all of the policies that we have in, in, in the pipeline together and match them up against the scale of the crisis, it's not enough. And, and that's true of countries around the world. Um, but there's a real seriousness about tackling these issues. And there's a recognition that we want economic growth, we want prosperity, we want trade. But we need a system where those things don't happen at the expense of the natural world um, or at the expense of the standards that people hold dear. Um, and, and, and that commitment is real. It's very real. Um, and it's not to say there won't be arguments and it's not to say that governments won't make mistakes and this government won't make mistakes. But the commitment is very real. And I feel that as a you know, lifelong environmentalist, I, I haven't felt that I've had to clip my own wings that much. Obviously, I have to be careful sometimes in things I say, and I won't win every battle, and I won't agree with every detail of what government does. But broadly speaking, the pressure on me from the Prime Minister is to go for more and more and more and be as greedy as possible on these issues. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. And if you were advising, you know, ordinary mortals like me sitting around the table here, um, uh, what would you be telling us to do now? I mean, it, in terms of everyday citizens, mm. What should we be, you know, what should we be pushing for? What should we be advocating for? What we should be actually doing? I, I think that the, the people, there's no distinction really between people who are political and people who aren't. Pretty much anyone who's alive is political. If you've ever signed a petition, you know, if you've ever complained about something after reading the papers, you, you are political. You don't have to be elected politician or as I am in the House of Lords to be a politician. And everyone's political. Um, and I think it's worth flexing your political muscles at every opportunity. That doesn't mean screaming and yelling. It doesn't mean being offensive or rude, although that unfortunately happens a lot nowadays. But, you know, getting in touch with your councillors, getting in touch with your MPs, letting them know how much this stuff matters to you is massively important. I was always disappointed as an MP for 10 years that I wasn't lobbied enough about the environment. I was lobbied about everything, but the environment came pretty low on the list, even in a place like sort of Richmond and Kingston, and where I know people do care about these issues. And I, it just feels to me that all politicians should all the time be reminded that, that people care about this stuff, that it's not a distant thing, box that needs to be ticked every now and again, that this is a really central concern. And it's not just the people who take to the streets on a Friday. Uh, it's, it's everyone that we all care. Um, so that very simply, and perhaps it's a cliche, but I would say just get involved and, and, and be political. Thank you so very much. That was uh, a great session. And I know we're over time, but I really appreciate your thoughts. I think that was, uh, that was very coherent. Thank you so much, Ellen. And thanks for all the work you do.